We're in the book of Ephesians. Uh, so if you have a Bible, you can meet me in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 is where we're going to be all the way to verse 33. Um, it's crazy to think we're almost done. Uh, Easter Sunday, we're going to land the plane uh, in the book of Ephesians. It's going to be a big therefore. So we've gone through this entire book. Easter Sunday is going to be therefore. If the tomb is empty, therefore. Right? And we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 1 on Easter Sunday because we skipped the first 14 verses of chapter 1 knowing that we'd come back to it. And, uh, but right now we're in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to 33. Last week, uh, Jono, who's one of our pastors here, he, uh, he preached Ephesians chapter 6, the first nine verses, skipped this portion um, and uh, said that I would come back to it. And there was a reason for it. All right? It's not like he skipped it because he was afraid of it. He wasn't. This brother can preach. Uh, he'll preach any text in the Bible. Incredible sermon last week. Thank you, brother, for serving us. Um, but we're in Ephesians chapter 5. And we're talking about marriage today. We're talking about marriage. And um, I know th- there's some things that I'm going to say that are going to feel uncomfortable for many of us. I know that. I know that. Because the, the Bible looks at marriage different to how society looks at marriage. And, and in many ways, what the Bible says rubs against culture. And so there's some things I'm going to say that you're going to be like, mm, oh, no, I don't think so. That makes me feel uncomfortable. But, but don't check out. My hope is that you would stay connected, stay plugged in, and just simply ask the Holy Spirit to reveal that. Like you're going, I don't really see it that way. Why is that? Holy Spirit, would you reveal it to me? My hope is that He will. I know He will. And so much has been said about this passage. A lot has been said about this passage. Many of us have probably heard it being preached at weddings or uh, maybe at a church that you were a part of. In fact, over the years, this passage has become a place of great controversy, largely because of the word submit. Oh, we hate that word, submit. But however controversial it may be, because here at Rooted Fellowship, we believe every single word is the word of God. We unpack every single scripture. And we do so to understand it so that we might obey it. And so to help us navigate it well, this portion of Scripture, I want to start where Paul ends. All right, I'm going to start where Paul ends. And so look with me, verse 31 and 32. Here's how he concludes after talking about marriage. He says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. You see, Paul quotes from Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 here, which says that when a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, they become one flesh. But then he adds a little bit more in verse 32. He says, this mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Now, there are two powerful things that we need to see here and understand two incredibly important things that are being communicated here. Firstly, we see the amazing unity of marriage. The amazing unity of marriage. This this covenant that's been created by God, not by us, created by God, is full of mystery and sacred depth. That men and women become one flesh. And when the Bible says that, it's suggesting an exchange of souls. Christians in marriage have the same Lord, the same family, the same children, the same future, and the same destiny. What happens is that there is a a exchange, a mingling of souls. It's beautiful. The two become one. And this isn't something that we say because it sounds romantic. It's not something that we say because we're trying to scare people out of divorce. No, no, no. The true truly do become one. But secondly, the second important thing that we see here is that the marriage union is a picture of the union between Christ and the church. It's a picture of the union of Christ and His church. You see, Christ loved the church from eternity. And the spiritual mystery, which was hidden in the creation of Eve as the first Adam's wife, and in their becoming one flesh, is revealed in the creation of the church to be the bride of Christ, the second Adam. It's a picture, a beautiful picture of Christ and the church. Let me explain it this way. How many Batman fans are there in the room? There we go. 
And I love that because he's actually truly a Marvel fan, but I'm working on him. You know, God is doing something. And so, 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 so Batman, I'm a huge Batman fan. And, and, and every now and then, uh, Commissioner Gordon and Batman, they'll, they'll shine the Batman signal over Gotham City. And they do that so that, that the city, when they see the sign, they know vengeance and justice is looming over the city. That's the point, right? That's the point. It's, it's, they see the sign and they go, nope, justice and vengeance is here. See, marriage is supposed to be like that. It's supposed to put on display to the world the union between Christ and the church. That, that when the world looks at a healthy, godly Christian marriage, they go, oh, that's supposed to point to Christ and the church. Modern Lloyd-Jones says this. He says, this is true in regard to the pattern of the first man and the first woman. Woman was made at the beginning as a result of an operation which God performed upon man. How does the church come into being? As the result of an operation which God performed on the second man, his only begotten beloved son on Calvary's hill. See, a deep sleep fell upon Adam. A deep sleep fell upon the son of God. He gave up the ghost. He expired. And there in that operation, the church was taken out. As the woman was taken out of Adam, so the church is taken out of Christ the woman was taken out of the side of Adam and it is from the Lord's bleeding, wounded side that the church comes. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Marriage is meant to point to this beautiful union between Christ and the church. And so the two become one and we're putting on display Christ and the church. Those are two important things that we need to understand. They act as a foundation because if you don't have that and you look at other passages in the Bible that speak about marriage, you're not going to understand it. You're not going to understand it. And so it's important for us to know. Now, I say all of this realizing that there's a lot of single people in the room today. Please don't check out. All right? Don't go, oh, they're talking about marriage. This is an opportunity for me to take a quick nap. Please don't. It's important for you to hear this. It's important for you to hear this. I'll give you two reasons. Uh, reason number one is that one day you might get married. You might find someone to spend the rest of your life with. And so you need to understand what marriage is all about. You need to know how God sees marriage. The second reason that you shouldn't check out, the second reason that this is important for you to hear is that single people, hear me, you are called to hold married people accountable as well. Remember, we are beautifully designed for fellowship. Beautifully designed for fellowship. And so, single people, you, you are called to, to hold married people accountable. Why? Because it impacts your gospel witness. You're out there sharing the gospel with people, talking about how, oh, no, it's Christ in the church, and here's what he did. It's beautiful. You see, when you look to marriage, people are looking at marriage in the church and going, I, what? What? You're talking about Christ in the church. You're talking about how beautiful it is. We're going to unpack a lot of that this morning. And, and they're going, but the marriages in the church are as broken as they are in society. It's impacting your gospel witness. And so hold us accountable. I, I had a friend uh, who was in this church. He graduated, moved down to Durban to become a doctor. So Durban gained, we lost. But the kingdom of God advances, so it's all good. His name was Ora. And he would frequently ask me, Ona, how's your marriage? How's your marriage? And I'd be honest. I'd be like, well, you know, we're in a great season. And sometimes I'd be like, man, it's really tough. I need you to pray for me. And so single folks, hold us accountable. Ask us. When you see folks showing up on a Sunday and they're not sitting together or there's a vibe, or just go and be like, hey, how's, how's your marriage? And married folks, you, now you know. You can't be like, well, get out of my business. No, 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 no. If they say that, you say, well, I need to know because it's impacting my gospel witness. Do you guys know that in this very country, 40% of marriages don't make it to year 10? Now, now we've become desensitized. Desen Woo! There we go. Thank you very much. To that word, we, we, we've become that because it, it's so normal to see divorces today. So we just go, oh, 40%. Oh, sounds bad. Okay, let me carry on with my life. So let me give it to you this way. If a, an airline said to you that every four of our 10 flights don't make it, 
about 50%, they don't make it. I'm pretty sure that folks in here would be like, you know what, that bus ticket to Cape Town doesn't look too bad right now. Hold us accountable. Now with that said, uh, let me do what we love to do here at Rooted Fellowship as we come to God's Word, and that is set some context. All right, so let me give some context to what's going on here as Paul writes these words. See, a lot of women in the ancient world were very poor, and upward mobility for a woman was not only uphill, but it came with many obstacles. Wives were treated with little respect, and they could be easily cast aside by their husbands. That, that was the culture back then. The situation in Israel of Paul's day was so bad that some Jewish women actually just simply refused to get married. It's like, I have a really good situation at home. I have a loving father. Why would I leave that to go and be with this man who's not going to take care of me, who's not going to love me, who's going to cast me aside? Marriage offered so little security and protection back in the day. But instead of just reflecting about this, instead of just accommodating the standards of the world, no, 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 the, the, the Bible confronts it. Jesus confronts it. Paul confronts it. He goes, no, no, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna go around it. I'm not gonna be like, oh, okay, that's how society lives. Okay, cool, if you guys are happy with that, that's fine. No, 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 they confront it. Paul's teaching on marriage is one that gives status and dignity and security to women. It is no coincidence that in countries where the Bible has had a strong, healthy, that's important, healthy, God-glorifying influence, the situation of women has improved dramatically, whereas under other religions, generally treated poorly as second-class citizens. Now, it's important for me to say a healthy, God-glorifying influence, because I, I know what happens. A lot of us, we, we will go, this isn't true because of the people that represent this. And then we say God's a liar. We shouldn't do that. We shouldn't. I agree 100% that those who represent the Bible, and the, they should be so aligned that we're constantly going, God, what are you saying to us? Uh, help us interpret your word so that we might obey it and do so faithfully. But I know, I know that we live in, in a context, and history has shown this, that there have been many representatives of the scriptures who don't follow God's word. But it doesn't mean that we go, well, God, then you're a liar, I can't trust you. No, we then turn away from that and we become faithful to what God is saying. Still say, uh, setting some context here real quick. On the issue of submission, because we're going to talk about submission quite a bit, I want to point out that the Bible does not, in fact, single out women for submission. It doesn't do that. In fact, all Christians are called to submit. Uh, this is Paul's general theme, which he is now working out in detail. He talks about this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, where he says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. All of us, all believers are to submit to Christ, our Lord and King. All of us are called to submit to, 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 to all sorts of things that the Bible tells us. We're called to submit to circular uh, authorities like government. We've just done that in this period of COVID. We're, we're called to, to submit to spiritual authority in the church. Hebrews 13 verse 17. This is why we're always saying to people, get plugged in, be a part of a local church, because this is part of God's design. We're all called to submit. To be a Christian involves submission, and we are all called to it. In fact, the very gospel that we believe in requires us to submit, to surrender our lives to Christ. Now, this does not mean that there are no distinctions, right? It doesn't mean that there are no distinctions. You'll sometimes hear people say that Paul teaches mutual submission between husbands and wives. But this is not true. Stay with me. This is not true. Paul has set down the, the principle of submission in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. I just read it to us. And then now he works it out in, in, in three distinct relationships. So he goes, now all of us must submit, but now hey, there's some distinctions here, and he begins to work them out. Uh, last week, Jono preached on, on children submitting to parents and servants submitting to masters. And now we're going to see wives submitting to husbands. In each case, he also strongly encourages those who receive submission to provide loving, godly leadership. But that is not the same as mutual submission. Masters do not submit to their servants. Parents do not submit to their children. 
we, we don't, like, I don't do that. Like, I have loving conversations with my children, but we're not sitting there deciding financially hey, what we're going to do and where we're going next. And it's, that's not how it is. The text tells us that husbands do not submit to wives. Stay with me. What the Bible does teach is mutual servanthood. Serving one another for mutual benefit and mutual flourishing as we serve God. And we're going to see that. I'll say one last thing about submission and then we'll get to the text. Submission is a mark of redemption in Jesus Christ. God created men and women to live in harmony of mutual ministry. But sin has changed this. Sin has replaced submission and servanthood. And now it's all about me and what can I get and, and look at me and I'm important. That's what it's all about now. But we need to remember Jesus Christ. He came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And where Jesus lives and rules, this will always be the pattern. What pattern? Whoever wants to be first must take the last place and be a servant of everyone else. That's the pattern. And so with that, with this context, let's now look at the text. Verse 22. It says, Wives, submit to your husbands. That's important. Submit to your husbands. Wives, it doesn't say submit to every single man. Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. That's important. I want you to hold on to that. As to the Lord. We're going to come back to it. Because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Now, in reading that, my hope is that your first question would be, what does submit mean? What does it really mean? Well, in its simplest form, submit means to obey. That's what it means. It, it means to obey. It means wives are, are willingly accepting the authority of their husbands in their God-given role of leading and marriage. See, the particular word that Paul uses here to communicate submission is the Greek word hupotasio. Hupotasio, which is important. It's important for us to know this word, hupotasio, which means to incline oneself to someone or to willingly submit to the authority of someone. Hupotasio. Let me read it to you again. To incline oneself to someone or to willingly submit to the authority of someone. It is therefore not husbands who place wives into submission, but wives who actively take up this position with respect to their husbands. It is therefore not husbands, listen to me, husbands who place wives into submission, no, but wives who actively take up this position with respect to their husbands. Where have we heard this kind of language? Because it should sound familiar. Where, where have we heard it before? Well, to save time, I'll go ahead and tell you. Jesus. Jesus in John chapter 10 says this. He says, this is why the Father loves me. Because I lay down my life so that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. That, 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 that when, when, when wives willingly submit, what they're doing is they're, they're showing a, a beautiful attribute of Jesus. It's not us as husbands who do this. They willingly do it. It's important to take note that when Paul goes on to speak of the submission of children to parents and servants to masters, he, he uses a different word for submission. Now, now, I know when we read it in the English, so much gets lost. But when you read it in the Greek, you realize, wow, he's, he's using a different word here. He, he uses the word hupakuyo. Not hupatasso, but hupakuyo, which speaks of a more drastic subordination. It's a, it's a I say you do kind of relationship. Very different. Very different. The word that Paul applies to wives, while it includes obedience to commands, it has the more general sense of arranging one's life under someone's direction. You're in control. 
This makes the point that the submission of wives is an active rather than a passive calling. The godly wife does not wait around for detailed orders like some low-level employee, no. But she acts assertively in purpose of the goals worked out together with her husband. That's what's going on here. And this is why, ladies, choosing or finding a man to call your husband is no small thing. It is no small thing. You should be careful about who you pursue or who you allow to pursue you. Be discerning of his character. Be careful. I cannot stress this enough. Be careful. Be discerning. Why? Because when you are married, God will expect you to submit to him in everything. That's what the text says. Verse 24 says, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. But don't forget the words, as to the Lord. As to the Lord. So husbands, be careful. She's called to submit to you in everything, but as to the Lord. What does that mean? It means we don't tolerate abuse. I'm going to go ahead and say it right here at Root of Fellowship. We do not tolerate abuse of any kind. Physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, we won't. Because I know how it's going to go. So, 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 some guys will hear this and go, oh, honest said, well, uh, wife, that's not what I'm saying and that's definitely not what the Bible is saying. As to the Lord. Now, this also means that wives, if your husband is leading you to sin, you don't submit. Christ would never lead the church to sin. You don't submit. If your husband is leading you to sin, you don't submit. And I, and I, I want to say this as graciously and yet as firmly as I can. Wives, if you feel like you're in a situation that is abusive, I want you to come and speak to us. Come and speak to me. And if you feel uncomfortable speaking to a man, come and speak to some of our, 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 our lady leaders here, some of our wives here. Pull someone aside. Please don't go without grabbing someone and going, hey, something just doesn't feel right in my marriage and I think I need to talk to someone about that. And we will engage because we do not, hear me, we do not tolerate abuse. We don't because God doesn't. I know that scriptures like this have been taken out of context and have been misused and, and they lead to horrible relationships. That is not what we are about. We want to be faithful to God's word. And so ladies, please be careful. Please be careful about who you decide to marry. And if you're unsure, get that person around community. Bring them here. Get them plugged in. Get them to spend some time with some of the older guys, guys who've been married for a while, because we'll sniff it out. We will. We'll, we'll just go, uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a young boy. This is a young boy. And that's not a bad thing, because get him plugged in. We'll disciple him. He'll grow. It'll be incredible. But also, we'll sniff out the wolves. The wolves in sheep's clothing. Who come and, and like, yeah, you know, I, no, I really do love God and I'm really into this. But meanwhile, I have no plans to be faithful to God and they'll definitely never be faithful to you. And we'll deal with them as the Bible calls us to deal with them. That's, that's not a, yeah, I realize that that just came out as like a massive threat. <laughs> That, that, is not, that is not what I meant. Listen, let me be clear. Um, we, di- we disciple people, but we, we'll kick out the wolves. And, and that I won't go back on. We'll, we'll kick, like if you are unwilling to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and you have other intentions here, we will kick you out. God's called us to protect the flock that he's entrusted to us. But Paul doesn't end there. He has some words for the husbands. From verse 25, he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. 
For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. Three things that Paul tells the husbands, three things that the husbands are called to. Sacrificial love, sanctifying love, and self-love. Sacrificial love, sanctifying love, and self-love. Let's start with the first one, sacrificial love. We see this in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. How, how did Christ love the church? He died for her. Husbands, we need to be willing to die for our wives. Not just physically, but in every other aspect of life as well. Dying to self. Being an example of Christ to our wives. Sacrificial love dies to self and serves the one it loves in unsung heroism. So many of us were waiting for a pat on the back from society. When actually who you need to get a pat from is your wife. We're so concerned about what other people think about us, forgetting the very person that we're called to love. Love the way Christ loves the church. It's a sacrificial love. But also, we're called to a sanctifying love. Verse 26, to make her holy. Other translations say to sanctify her, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. See, to sanctify means to make holy, to set apart, to consecrate. And in this context, Paul is probably pulling from cultural practice. This probably alludes to the ancient bridal bath in which a young woman would prepare herself for her wedding day by taking a ceremonial bath, signifying the washing away of her former life and cleansing the cleansing of her body for marriage. See, Christ cleansed his bride by giving himself up for her. That is, by dying on the cross for her sins. Paul says he cleansed her by the washing of water, which points to Christian baptism, a sign of Christ's death. Christ accomplishes this with the word, that is, through faith in the gospel. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. Our faith is not just about, oh, salvation, I'm good, I've got it, I'm going to put it in my back pocket, and I'm just going to wait until I die or Jesus returns. No, 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 it's so much more. Our faith is so much more. In fact, the scriptures here tell us in verse 27, he says, he did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. You see, Christ's saving work goes beyond obtaining for us the forgiveness of sins. It's more than that. He is at work now, right now, making us holy and cleansing us from sin. Though our spiritual growth may seem slow and partial, and though Christians in this life will never really fall, reach the, the fullness of Christ's likeness, one day, one day, we will stand before our Lord and Savior in full utter perfection. And so this life is like the bridal chamber, if you will, in which Christians are being cleansed in anticipation of a wedding that is soon to come. We read about this wedding in the book of Revelation. Christ beautifies us. Men, that's us too. Christ beautifies us. This is why I, I, I'm not uncomfortable to look at a man and say, you're beautiful. You're a beautiful man. You're a beautiful man because God is doing something beautiful in you. Christ beautifies us with his own righteousness and in the end he will make us glorious, fit to sit beside him on his throne and give him praise forever. This is Christ's ultimate goal for us, friends. It's our destiny. It is something that he does by his power and therefore it is a sure thing. We can anchor ourselves in that truth that that day is coming. This is what Christ is doing in our lives. And as we, the church, look forward to our wedding day, we ought to be filled with thanks and love for Christ. Because it should blow our minds. I hope it does. I hope the gospel never gets, gets old for you. That God would choose me. He would, he would choose me. I know me. That left to my own, there is no ways I would be a loving father, a loving husband. I wouldn't even be a good friend. And, and yet, he chose me. Friends, I hope this never gets old. 
that this should blow our minds that he's at work in us and through us and that one day we will stand before him in glory but here's what is so remarkable about this text Paul realizing this he then points to this as a model for the love of husbands the love that they are to have for their wives I mean that should blow your mind husbands as Christ love sanctifies us for glory a husband's love ought to be directed towards the spiritual growth of his wife and notice too that, that this ministry is associated with the husband's words the, the Greek word that is used here for word is rhema it's rhema, which, which signifies actual words rather than the, the, the more common word for word, which is logos, which points to a specific message. Here he's going, no, 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 I'm talking about actual words. And so husbands, what words are you using? Are they building up your wife or are they tearing her down? And it's not just about what comes out of your mouth, but it's also about what doesn't come out. Are there things that you should be saying that you're not saying? Because here, Paul uses the same, the same example, calls us to the same thing. This tells us that the words of a husband are important to his wife. John Stott says this, his headship will never be used to suppress his wife. He longs to see her liberated from everything which spoils her true feminine identity and growing towards that glory, that perfection of fulfilled personhood which will, be, which will be the final destiny of all those whom Christ redeems. To this end, Christ gave himself. To this end, too, the husbands give themselves in love. That's the call. I, I hope that this would feel like a, a cold bucket of water to your face because I read this and I'm just overwhelmed I'm overwhelmed but hear this the Holy Spirit empowers He empowers and so how are you doing in this department husbands are your words building up are they encouraging are they giving growth this leads me to the last kind of love that our husbands are called to and it's self love not a selfish love but a self love Verse 28, in the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. Paul is commanding us as husbands to nourish and cherish our wives. That's the call. To nourish and cherish our wives. You see, back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible made it clear on what the man was called to do. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. Th this idea is to nurture and to protect. See, Adam was a gardener. And the purpose of a gardener is to make things grow. And if things don't grow, you're a bad gardener. There's no other way to put it. Likewise, a husband's work is to make things grow. It's to tend and cultivate the soil of his wife's heart. This requires him to pay attention to her. If you're going to do that, it requires you to pay attention to her, to talk to her, to know what her hopes and fears are, what her dreams are, when she feels vulnerable and unworthy, what makes her anxious and what gives her joy. You should know these things, husbands. And if you, you don't, then ask. It's that simple. Ask and, and, and just simply listen. Just listen. And then after that, ask this question. It's a dangerous question, but it's, it's an important one. Ask, where am I falling short? We don't like that question. Just I think as human beings, we don't like it. As husbands, we don't like it because it means we're going to have to now walk in our insecurities. But know this. She's sharing these things. She's not doing it out of malice. She's doing it because she loves you. And she's recognizing the call upon your life and how you can both flourish. Know your wife's heart. Just as a husband can be driven away by a nagging and controlling wife, Proverbs 27, 15 to 20, this is true, a wife's heart can be dried up by a husband who pays her little to no attention. 
who takes no interest in her, emo her emotional life and does not connect with her heart. Husbands, if you don't know, ask. Ask. The Bible tells us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And when it comes to marriage, a husband's care for his wife is really to love her as he loves himself. And I know that this is difficult. I know this is hard for a number of reasons. One is because sometimes men, let's just be honest, we're idiots. We do dumb things. We say stupid things. We, that, that's just the reality. And so we struggle sometimes in that area. But another reason that we struggle to love our wives as we love ourselves is because we don't know how to love ourselves. We don't know what that means. Where dignity has been stripped from us because of sin, we have no idea who we are. And so we enter into relationships and then into marriage and we go, love her as I love myself, but I have no idea how to love myself. I have no idea what it means to be a child of God, what it means to be a son of the kingdom. No idea. Because every earthly example has failed me, and horribly so. But that's okay. This is why we enter into discipleship relationships. This is why we pour into our men and into our women. We, we want you to understand what it means to be a child of God. Because from that place, I'm telling you, from that place, men, to know that you are loved, that, that God is, is proud of you. And it's not because of anything that you've done, but because of the finished work of His Son. He loves you. We struggle to hear those words because we don't know what to do with them. God wants you to know that you are loved more than you could ever imagine. And so husbands, a Christian wife is still daddy's little girl. And husbands are held to account by God for their ministry to the daughters of the kingdom of God. God holds you accountable. And one day you will stand before him and he's going to ask you, how did you treat my little girl? She's my daughter. How did you treat her? Was it like this? Or was it in your own selfish way? Paul closes by summarizing, literally summarizing everything he's just said to us. In verse 33, he says, To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. Now, now I know it's easier to say this. When it comes to the doing, it gets really, really complicated. I know that. I'm married. I've been married for 12 years. I know. It's, it's, it's super easy to go, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. It's so hard to do this day in and day out. But, but hear this, hear this. Married couples, you can find compatibility. It is possible through a shared experience of Christ's love. That's how. A shared experience of Christ's love and a shared commitment to obey God's word. It's so possible. This is why for me, the first thing I do when I meet a married couple and they're going through some stuff, I go, do you know the love of Christ? Because I can give you tools, I can give you systems, I can give you great books, and you'll, like, it'll be great and you'll read them and maybe they'll fix a few things. But at some point, you're going to fall again, you're going to trip, something is going to happen, and then what are you going to do? But a shared experience of Christ's love and a shared commitment to obey the Word of God, that'll get you through every single time. This alone will produce the spiritual resources and the shared vision needed for shalom in marriage, not just peace. Peace is, yeah, yeah it sees fire between one another. It's like, okay, we've stopped fighting. That's what peace is. You know, when kids fight, you're like, hey, hey, go there, go there. That's peace. Sh shalom, shalom is this universal flourishing. That is the very intention of God for His kingdom, is that we would have shalom, this beautiful, interdependent working of one another, of God's creation, where there's just universal flourishing. You can have that in your marriage. But will you anchor yourself in the gospel? In order to have a good marriage, both partners really need to believe the Bible is God's word. Now, I know, I know this is tough. I know it's tough. I read this a lot, and there's a lot of stuff in here that I'll read, and I'll just go, 
God, I don't know about that one. I don't know about that one because I've been living 37 years. I had to remember there for a moment. I was like, how old? How old? 37 years of my life. And, and for most of it, I was doing whatever I wanted. I sat on the throne. I thought I was the master of my own destiny. And then I realized that I'm loved more than I could ever imagine by the creator of everything. That in his son, Jesus has forgiven me and draws me to himself. And then I, he says, okay, now everything you need to know about how to do life, everything you need to know about me is here. And I open this thing up and I go, you're calling me to what? Love your enemy. Ah. <laughs> Turn the other cheek. And I know how we get around this. You'd be like, okay, God, I'm done with cheeks now. I have no more cheeks to turn. <laughs> but remember I said that the gospel requires submission. And even when it's difficult, you go, Holy Spirit, this is a, this is a hard teaching. The disciples would often say that to Jesus. A a and he didn't go, oh, okay, okay, let me try to lower the bar. Let me try to make it. No, 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 no. He's like, okay, I know it's a hard teaching. That's why I'm here. It requires both to believe that the Bible is God's word. It requires both to love Christ. It requires both to have the Holy Spirit in their hearts. And then you'll be on your way to a marriage that has shalom in it. Let me close with these words. Because Jesus is involved in your marriage, and I really hope so, God-glorifying marriages should have, and here I'm going to quote my good friend Rory Dyer. Here's what he says about marriages. That they should be a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. I like that. That's the kind of marriage I want to have. A good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, if these words sound familiar to you, well, it's because you've probably heard them in the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, God is speaking to Moses, and he's saying to Moses, I want you to go back to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. I want them to come out of slavery after 400 years of slavery and oppression. Uh, I'm taking them to a place of freedom, goodness, and fruitfulness. Doesn't that sound good? Freedom, goodness, and fruitfulness. And, 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 and we're being told that even in our marriage, we can experience freedom, goodness, and fruitfulness. A good and spacious land flowing with milk and honey. Friends, your marriage, because of what Jesus has done on the cross, it can be good. There's a lot of marriages that are not. They pretend and they perform. But when you close the doors and you get in your car and you leave, it is evil. They're attacking one another with sarcasm and bad jokes. They're always trying to outdo the other, and it's not an honor. But your marriage can be good. It can be spacious. Your marriage should be spacious. It should never feel like you're suffocating. And I know, I know that there's husbands out there, they come back from work, and they just sit in the parking, and they go, I just need to sit here for 10 minutes because I'm about to walk into a space that is incredibly suffocating. How can your car be more spacious than your marriage? can be spacious. It, it, it can be flowing, 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 which means it's living. A river that's not flowing is not alive. Nothing grows there. But your marriage can be flowing with milk and honey. Milk. We give uh, milk to babies because we want them to grow. We want your marriage to grow. And then honey, my favorite one. Your marriage should be sweet. You should enjoy it. It should be fun. You should be able to look at your spouse and go, this is my best friend. And I would rather hang out with this person than anyone in the world. If that's not the case, friends, something is up. And you need to ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart and go, what's going on? What's going on in my marriage? Because the Bible tells us it's possible to have a marriage that is good and spacious and flowing with milk and honey. Your marriage should not be a desert. Band, you guys can come up. Your, 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 your marriage should not be a desert. And I know for some of you, like, you, you don't even realize that it's a desert because every now and then you'll walk and then you'll come across an oasis and you'll be like, oh, this is good. Yeah, no, my marriage is in a great place. No, 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 you're still in a desert. And you'll drink and you'll be happy and it'll be great and then you'll keep walking and you'll be like, yo, but now it's hot again. There's no shade, I'm tired, you're nagging me the whole time. 
It's because you're in a desert. God has not called us to live in a desert. We are not desert people. We are people who are called to live in a good and spacious land that is flowing with milk and honey. And because we believe this to be true, what we're doing here at Rooted Fellowship, right after Easter, we're starting a marriage course. Seven months. One session every month. It's going to be dessert and a date. We're not feeding you. You can eat at home. But we'll give you good dessert. And we're just going to walk through some practical things that, 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 that all marriages go through. And we're going we're gonna to chat about them. And you're going to chat with your spouse. And you, you're just going to maintain your marriage. So that it remains a good and spacious land flowing with milk and honey. And this is important. Every married person needs to be a part of this. I'm pulling no punches. In fact, r- married people, raise your hands. There's a lot more of us in the first gathering, but I know you're here. How many of you own cars? Keep your hand up. It's okay. How many of you own cars? Great. Great. Keep it up. How many of you take your cars in for a service regularly when you're supposed to? I don't see any hands going down. Some are unsure. Ruth is like, I, I, I kind of, I, I do it myself. I, no, no. But you do. You, when you bought the car, it came with a plan. And so you, you just go, cool, I'm going to do that. Or maybe it didn't come with a plan or the plan is done, but you're still going, it's necessary for me to take my car in for a service. Because if you don't, it will break down. Or maybe on that day when you decide to, maybe after two, three, four years, you're like, you know what, I need to take this car in for a service. Your wife goes, hey, you know, I'm hearing something funny in the engine. Maybe you need to take it in for a service. You go there crossing your fingers, hoping that, you know what, I hope they don't find something massive because, Aisha, I don't have the box for it. See, many of us, we treat our marriages like that. You can put your hand down. Many of us treat our marriages like that. We'll, we'll, we'll show up to a Sunday service and, oh, they so happen to be preaching on marriage and you're like, I'm holding, I hope we're okay. I hope we get out of this and, and we're all good. It's not supposed to be like that. You should know. And so I'm encouraging all of you to be a part of this marriage course. Sign up for it, show up, participate, dive deeply into it. My hope is that you would care more about your marriage than you do your car. Because all of you have said you don't skip your service intervals. Don't skip these marriage ones. A good and spacious land flowing with milk and honey. That's what God wants for every single marriage. Amen. And so, Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that it is living and active, that it continues to engage us, that these are tough words, these are challenging words, but they are true. And where we fall short, Holy Spirit, you are there to pick us up. You are there to help us and guide us and empower us. And so would you do so? Lord, I pray for the married folks in this room. I pray for those who are going through a difficult season in their lives. Lord, I pray that your light would shine in the areas of darkness that where repentance is needed, where confession needs to happen, that it would happen. That forgiveness would be put on the table and that it would be received. God, give grace where it is needed. I'm thankful for the marriages that are doing well. I pray that you just continue to grow those, that they would become an example to us. Because ultimately, God, we want to put on display the union between you, Jesus, and the church. Help us. Help us to do that in a way that is pleasing to you, that honors you. Our marriages should be a sweet fragrance to you. And that the world would look and go, there's something radically different about these people. What is it? And our answer would be Christ and Him crucified. We love you, Lord. We need you. We ask all of this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.